Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix this morning here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. President Biden says Vladimir Putin will never win his war in Ukraine as the Wall Street Journal reports Xi Jinping is preparing to visit Moscow. We'll discuss with Ukraine's Deputy Minister for Agrarian Policy. Phasing out the big four, China is urging state-owned firms to stop using the biggest international accounting firms, signalling continued concerns about data security. Plus, Lloyd's drops in London trade after a mixed set of results as the lender announces a £2 billion buyback. We will have more from our interview with the CEO. Welcome to the programme, everybody. Just gone 9 o'clock here in London, 10 o'clock if you're in Paris or Berlin. Let's get straight to a markets check. An hour into the trading day, and you can see the stocks Europe here in, here in, uh, in Europe is down by 8 tenths of 1%. Pretty broad-based across sectors. Only one sector, last time I checked, in positive territory. That was media, and that was largely to do with an update from Volta's Kluwer over in the Netherlands. So uh, that's the state of play on equities. S&P futures, pretty flat. We'd actually seen a bit more positivity in the US futures picture, so that's deteriorated over the past hour or so. We'll keep that in mind as we head towards the US session and keeping an eye certainly on the yield story. We see uh, yield movements really to the fore yesterday. We saw yields going higher in treasuries and on uh, gilt markets in yesterday's trading session. Uh, today we've got yields going higher in the UK up by three basis, uh, three basis points at the short end I can see and similar amounts actually across the curve up by around that over at the 10, uh, the 10 year tenor as well. Let me get to some data coming out. Uh, in fact let me get to the map of European stocks. You can see it's pretty broad based. I mentioned there was only one sector in positive territory. Well, no geographies in positive territory, as you can see there. Uh, some of the worst of the selling coming through, it seems, over on the Ibex in Spain. Let's get to some breaking news. The German EFO data, so this crucial measure of business confidence. Uh, the EFO number then coming in, that confidence index at 91.1. The estimate was for 91.2, so not a million miles away from where the estimate was. This is a crucial guide on the German economy, of course. And have we seen a deep, a deep uh, downturn averted for the German economy? That's the key question really hanging over Germany, hanging over the Eurozone. Hearing yesterday from the ECB's Christine Lagarde, she expects no economies to be in recession in the Eurozone in 2020. 2023. Is that a bold call? We'll talk more about that a little bit later. We're going to be talking to the Deputy Director, Head of Surveys at the IFO Institute. That conversation coming up a little bit later on, so we'll deep dive into the German economy shortly. For the moment, let's take a step back and talk about the global picture. Global bonds are poised to erase all of the gains made in January's record rally as uh, Fed pivot hopes wither. A Bloomberg index of global bonds has dropped some 2.9% this month, unwinding most of its surge early this year. Joining us now is JP Morgan Asset Management's EMEA Chief Market Strategist, Karen Ward. Um, Karen, very nice to, to have you with us. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, let me ask you about the global bond market story then and how it's developing very much before our eyes. Because just yesterday we had that PMI data that was positive, uh, positive in the sense of the economy's doing well, but that gets everybody worried about how high rates go. What do you see for the rates story as a result of this strength in data? Well, I think that's exactly it. I mean, sadly, the slowdown, weak activity, recession this year was required. It was what the central banks last year were saying was the price they had to pay to bring inflation down. So unfortunately, we're in that point in markets where good economic news is bad news for markets. And I think the market had just got a little carried away at the start of this month that Goldilocks was back mm. and that we could have strong growth with inflation pressures completely diminishing because we had a couple of indicators that shelter inflation was rolling down, wage costs were at least peaking in the US. So that Goldilocks narrative gained a little bit too much momentum. That was just too complacent. We're just not going back to that very low inflation world. And I think investors, particularly in the bond market, just need to shed the idea that 2 or 3% on the US 10-year is the right number. OK, and so how high do those rates go? And, and how long do we stay there, I suppose, crucially? Because you think that we are in a structurally very different world, that yeah. higher inflation and higher rates are here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like 4% on the US 10-year. It feels about right. I think what, what I was getting uncomfortable about in in pricing wasn't so much that rates needed to go much higher it was the idea that the Fed was going to be dramatically cutting them by the end of the year um, 
And, and again, that just seemed too Goldilocks to me that inflation pressures would completely diminish and they'd be able to rapidly cut to try and engineer that soft landing. So it's the, it's the sort of medium term trajectory for where rates settle. Not that I think they're going to go much higher in the short term. So I don't think in any way we're looking at bond problems like we experienced last year. Mm. The scale of that repricing and reset, I think, was a one off. But I just don't think you're going to get capital gains on bonds this year in the way that some are forecasting. So maybe we just don't reverse those bond moves. Exactly. But that's fine. We're mm. getting then 4% income on a, on a US 10 year. We're getting 55 on, on an investment grade bond. And we're getting something more comfortably now what we could actually call high yield. Right. I don't want those yields to come lower. I like the income. And then, of course, we also get diversification from those bonds if things do turn out badly. I suppose we spend a lot of time worrying about high inflation, worrying about where the global economy lands, Karen, and maybe not enough time reflecting on the end of the low interest rate environment and what that really does offer to investors. Give us a sense of the opportunities then that you see. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think the critical point to me is that inflation will come down. It's not going to stay near double digits, but I think it's going to settle structurally something a little bit higher. Um, the goods disinflation that was so evident, I mean, the best stat to give you here, Anna, is that in the UK, the basket of the goods we, we bought cost the same in 1990 as it did 30 years later. Mm. It's really hard, I think, to envisage the same thing happening again. So we're not going to see that goods disinflation, the structural forces um, raising inflation slightly are going to be there. And I also think the central banks eventually, not today, will move their inflation targets on the basis that three is a better number than two. Um, so I actually think for investors, though, this is really good news. Mm. You know, often investors say to me, well, hang on, zero interest rates, low inflation was great for investors. It was great for investing in mega cap tech. Tech, yes. <laughs> but it wasn't great for the whole market. It wasn't great for bonds. Um, it wasn't great for European stocks. It wasn't great for financials globally. It wasn't great for value stocks. And so for me, it's really about thinking what this new world looks like and then who are going to be the beneficiaries. Mm. It will not be the beneficiaries that were those of the last cycle. Okay. That's what's really critical. So this is a different cycle. So where does that leave European stocks then? And we've got a few dynamics in the mix. I mean, European equities have had a good start to the year or had been having a good start to the year because of Chinese reopening. That was certainly a narrative we're following closely. Some houses saying maybe that's done. Maybe we've seen that rally. Also, the banking sector doing well out of net interest margins. I mean, where do you see the focus for gains in European stocks? Well, I think there's a cyclical and a structural story. The cyclical is... You know, the risk that we faced a couple of months ago, which was that Europe would simply run out of gas mm. and they would be working out how to ration it between corporates and households, that's gone. We've got 70% gas in storage. We're not only fine for this winter, we're fine for next winter. And by the time we're looking at the one beyond, we've got renewable plans. So, in fact, the energy crisis for Europe, that risk has not materialised. I also don't think Europe then, you know, we talked at the beginning about whether resilient data is actually good news for investors. I think for the US it's very questionable, but it's not necessarily the case for Europe. I think the ECB isn't as worried about overheating um, in the way that the Fed is. So I think the cyclical story has improved dramatically, the resilience of consumer demand in the face of higher interest rates. Then there's the structural story, which is partly about nominal growth. I mean, I just think that... The, the Eurozone's lost decade, which it really was. I mean, last mm. decade was just awful. Nominal GDP, stagnant. Um, I think austerity was a really big part of that story. And we've seen the mindset of governments in Europe totally change during the pandemic and uh, the war on its doorstep. So you see more fiscal generosity? It's, it's, in, the, it's in the pipeline. The plans, the recovery plans are will, I think, just be further ramped up. So I think that the underlying nominal growth picture for Europe is now structurally different. And then, of course, Anna, we haven't even got into the sectoral composition of the mm. benchmark, which is really important also. Because, as we've said, last, year, last decade you wanted mega-cap growth. Where would you go for that? You went to the US. Now you're thinking about financials, you're thinking about some value segments of the market, you're thinking about climate technologies as the structural trend, where will you go? You can come to Europe. So is it crucial then that Europe tries to match some of the subsidies that the US is doing around incentivising investment in climate technology, if that's going to be part of, of Europe's uh, sort of USP? Possibly. I mean, I think that we have to distinguish between investors and economies, because if there's a subsidy which means a company, a major turbine producer, for example, an electric car manufacturer, sets up a plant, a European company sets up a plant 
in the US, that's going to boost their economic growth. But if you're a stock picker, mm. it's <laughs> less relevant. Yeah. Um, so I think Europe benefits whatever shakes out of the IRA versus EU plan. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we'll see some degree of matching. OK, Karen, thank you so much. Really good to see you. Uh, JP Morgan, Asset Management's EMEA Chief Market Strategist, Karen Ward, joining us here to talk about her outlook for the year. Coming up, we discuss that latest uh, IFO data that we just broke at the top of the hour. We take the temperature of the German economy. The Deputy Director of the IFO Institute joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London. Uh, in for Francine Lacroix today. Let's get a Bloomberg First Word news update. Some of the top stories we're covering this morning. Here's Bloomberg's Leanne Gerrans. And a good morning. U.S. President Joe Biden says Vladimir Putin will never win his war in Ukraine. In a speech marking almost one year since the invasion, Biden also warned there will be hard and very bitter days ahead. empire will never be able to ease the people's love of liberty. Brutality will never grind down the will of the free. And Ukraine, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. Now, China's top diplomat says relations with Moscow are, quote, as solid as a rock. Wang Yi's comments were broadcast on Russian TV after a meeting in Moscow. Now, the Wall Street Journal reports Chinese President Xi Jinping is preparing to visit Russia for a summit with Putin in April or May. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg. Anna. Leanne, thank you. Now, over to Germany. Germany's business outlook has improved for a fifth month as Europe's biggest economy looks set to avoid the gloomy scenarios many feared after Russia invaded Ukraine. And expectations gauged by the IFO Institute rose to 88.5 in February from 86.4 the previous month. Joining us now from Munich is uh, Klaus Wuhlraber, who is here to discuss the, the findings, Deputy Director and Head of Surveys at the IFO Institute. Klaus, thank you so much for joining us. So the business outlook improved Moving further amid so signs of resilience, I suppose, in the German economy. How would you sum up what we've seen today? Yeah, you said it right. Yeah, the German economy shows signs of resilience. So we see further easing uh, of a supply bottleneck. Um, there, the, the, um, there are a lot of firms that say they are less pessimistic about the upcoming months. So we have uh, uh, the energy prices are lowering. They are uh, decreasing. So they're good news for both the industry sector and also for the other sectors, especially the uh, service sector. Uh, yes, indeed, especially the service sector. I mean, yesterday we saw a German manufacturing PMI data, Klaus, that seemed to come in below estimates. It seems to be a little while since we got disappointing data from Germany. Are you at all nervous about maybe parts of the economy, the, the, the manufacturing side, for example? Yeah, I'm not nervous. I'm not concerned about the upcoming development of the German economy. We see a slight, a little drop in the assessment of the current situation in the industry sector, which is some kind of due to a weakened global demand. So the export uh, expectation dropped a little bit, but there's no signs of concern in this uh, in this way. Uh, as, but because the outlook, so the number of firms that seems to be pessimistic in the last months are gaining more and more optimism. Um, with uh, respect to the upcoming months, and also the service sector, especially we saw this time that the hotel sector and the tourism sector is quite optimistic uh, with respect to the summer holidays. So these are good, uh, good news for the German economy. Yeah, a lot of optimism around the summer then from the tourism uh, space. Klaus, let me ask you about the supply shortages. You, you said that we've seen an easing of some of the supply bottlenecks. How normal does the supply side look then in Germany now? Uh, to be honest, we are a little bit far away from being normal. So we have seen a drop of three percentage points from 48 to about 45 percent, which is historically quite high. But we see this easing uh, happening over the last uh, half a year, approximately. So these are good news. So for a lot of firms, there are still supply bottlenecks. 
which allows them, do not allow them to produce as much as they want to because we still have a large backlog of orders. But if this uh, development will continue, uh, we will see an, a picking up of the industry production over the next months. What do you expect to see for the German economy as a whole this year, whether we see a recession or not, Klaus? I saw the Bundesbank said this week it still expects output, output to fall slightly this year. Uh, I know that Christine Lagarde yesterday said she doesn't expect to see recession in any Eurozone country this year. What do you expect in 2023? Yeah, so we have, we're going to have a, a technical recession uh, in this quarter. So we have a, a, a weak quarter, the last quarter in 22, and we will have a negative growth rate uh, for the first quarter this year. But after that, we will see a pickup of, the, of growth rates in Germany. But for the whole year, uh, we will expect, in best case, a stagnation, maybe a slight plus, maybe a slight negative. So we, there will be a, uh, a growth rate around close to zero. So not as pessimistic as many were expecting last year, but also not so optimistic as we would like to have so. But uh, given the current situation, these are quite a good outlook. Klaus, a lot of European countries have done a lot to try to find alternative sources of energy to diversify away from Russian gas. And Germany has been certainly a driving force behind that. How far through that process do you think Germany is, uh, how far down the road in, in finding alternative sources and removing that concern from German business? Um, so the, 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 um, the po politics was quite encouraging or was trying a lot to accelerate it, to change or to, uh, to have new um, sources of energy supplies. So given the uh, abrupt change uh, or the, given the start of the uh, war in the Ukraine, we were quite successful. But the general development uh, uh, for new sources, uh, there's a lot of way to be done. So a lot of things to do for the German politics. So we do not, we cannot rest and say, okay, we have gone a quite good way. So energy prices went down, but it's uh, still a, a lot of way to go. So uh, politics, a lot of things to do. Also the uh, enterprises, the companies. So even the prices are low again, so there can be changes. So they, the, uh, the war can worsen and, uh, again. So then we could have a shortage or an increase in energy prices. So the firms on politics must be aware that things can change uh, quickly. So uh, they need to go the way, the way further they have uh, started last year. Mm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how businesses respond to the, those lower commodity prices. Klaus, thank you very much for joining us. Klaus uh, Volraba there, Deputy Director and Head of Surveys at the IFO Institute. Coming up on the programme, the EU says a Brexit deal is within sight. We have the latest on efforts to resolve the impasse over the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards here in London. Now, the EU's chief Brexit negotiator, Maros Sefcovic, says the finishing line in talks with the UK is within sight. London and Brussels are seeking a resolution to the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which deals with Northern Ireland's trading relationships with the EU and the UK, has been a post-Brexit sticking point. Uh, joining us now, Bloomberg's Joe Mays, uh, with analysis of this and other themes here in the UK right now. On the Northern Ireland Protocol, then, uh, Joe, we saw at the weekend to expect details on Monday. Then we saw on Monday we should expect details on Tuesday. Something is holding this up. Is it entirely domestic UK politics that is holding this? Uh, yes, it feels like it is. It's Rishi Sunak trying to get his party on, on board with his plan, and especially that key caucus of the Democratic Unionist Party, Northern Ireland's DUP, who are basically going to be the party from whom other Conservative MPs take their cue as to whether to support Sunak's deal. So, yeah, lots of work having to go on in Westminster to get all the ducks in line. But Rishi Sunak might have to ultimately decide he can't get all those people on board, but proceed regardless, because he might think that mm. you know, their red lines are just too difficult for this negotiation. Uh, and why does the view of the DUP matter, Joe? I mean, it, it's not the sort of tight control of Parliament that we saw under Theresa May and therefore the DUP had much more of a role in terms of the number of votes. Is it more about the tone that they set for Brexiteers? 
Yes, it's the tone and the very strong relationships they have with the European Research Group within the Tory party, the ERG, and very close links with influential former cabinet ministers like Jacob Rees-Mogg, you know, Simon Clarks at the meeting like yesterday between the DP and the ERG. Uh, yeah, there's, there are they're a pretty vocal minority, and yeah, they can really set the tone for this, and 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 they will kick up a real fuss if they feel like they're being you know, betrayed by Sunak and the negotiations. So yeah, they're they're a threat that has to be managed. Mm, yeah, despite some of our reporting suggesting that Northern Ireland, one of the places in the UK that's done quite well, actually, out of the Brexit uh, agreement, as it is, in terms of the economics, at least, the politics is something different. Just briefly then, Joe, how do you interpret the fact that UK nurses have suspended their strike for intensive talks with ministers? It does feel like there's been a, a subtle shift in mood. You know, we saw the evidence go into the pay review bodies yesterday where the Treasury was saying you know, 3.5% pay increases could be permissible. But then again, it seems like we've entered a new phase of these discussions around pay, which could be more positive. You know, the government's keeping its cards close to its chest at this point. But yes, a potential shifting in the mood that suggests we could see potentially an end to all these strikes. OK, Joe, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Joe Mays with the latest on the UK. We'll be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 in our half-hour special programming around the UK economy and UK politics. Coming up, Biden and Putin take centre stage as the world gets ready to mark one year of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. More on Ukraine next. This is Bloomberg. President Biden says Vladimir Putin will never win his war in Ukraine as the Wall Street Journal reports Xi Jinping is preparing to visit Moscow. We'll discuss with Ukraine's Deputy Minister for Agrarian Policy. Phasing out the big four, China is urging state-owned firms to stop using the biggest international accounting firms, signalling continued concerns about data security. Plus, Lloyd's drops in London trade after a mixed set of results as the lender announces a £2 billion buyback. We will bring you more of our interview with the CEO. Good morning and welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London in for Francine Lacroix this morning. President Biden had words for Russia in a speech marking one year since Moscow's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. A dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never be able to ease the people's love of liberty. Brutality will never grind down the will of the free. And Ukraine... Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. The U.S. president was speaking in Poland after President Putin used his State of the Nation address to say that Russia is suspending its participation in a key nuclear treaty. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is in Warsaw with the latest, has been watching the movements of the U.S. president and all the meetings he's been having. Oliver, what do we know about the, the pact that Russia said it will withdraw from, this important nuclear pact between Russia and the United States? That's right, the New START pact, that is the nuclear agreement between the United States and Russia. It is the only such pact in existence and it is the two biggest nuclear powers uh, on the planet. So obviously when we talk about withdrawing or suspending from that, I should say suspending, um, it gets people's attention. So this is a non-proliferation uh, agreement. This, this puts a maximum of 1,550 nuclear weapons that each nation could have. It comes with also some arrangements about being able to check and inspect for these weapons. But these inspections have been put on hold since the beginning of the pandemic. And then in January, the the U.S. said that Russia was not permitting these inspections to take place. So this suspension is perhaps more of a negative signal than an act of immense substance. We should note a couple things. Putin made it very clear this was not a withdrawal. This was a suspension. We should also say that the foreign ministry later said that they will actually abide by the treaty until 2026 when it ends. And also this does not cover the, the battlefield nukes, that is the fear um, that could be used in Ukraine. China's role in all of this clearly crucial and looms large on the agenda then this week. We know that China's top diplomat Wang Yi meets with uh, the Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov later today, Oli. Uh, what, what is China's role in this? So it seems that that meeting has just taken place. We got a couple photographs. We did not get a huge number of lines from it. What we did say is one line from, uh, from Wang Yi saying, regardless of changes in inter the international arena, China is willing to maintain good relationship with Russia. That is a fairly hedged pronouncement. We know that China has been sort of 
uh, semi-Russia aligned throughout all this, but it seems now that kind of wants to come to the table as a neutral broker for this U for the war in Ukraine, saying that they may have a roadmap for peace that they're going to put out this Friday. Very hard to say how that avenue is completed while respecting Ukrainian territorial sovereignty, which is obviously a red line for Ukraine, while also giving Russia what they need. Also, the Wall Street Journal overnight saying that Xi Jinping may go to Moscow in April or May. So an interesting line that's being tread here by China. Okay, Oliver, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook live for us in Warsaw. It was known as the breadbasket of Europe, but since July, Ukraine's grain exports have dropped some 30%, meaning nearly 11 million tonnes less wheat shipped to global markets. As the war in Ukraine approaches its one-year mark, the impact on global food prices has been stark. For a more detailed conversation, we're joined now by Ukraine's first Deputy Minister for Agrarian Policy and Food. Uh, that is Taras Vysotsky. Uh, Taras, very nice to speak to you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister, for talking to us. I want to ask you about agricultural policy in Ukraine. But first, I just would like to get your view, your thoughts on President Biden's visit to Kyiv and also to Warsaw. What do you think of seeing the, the, the uh, US president in Ukraine? Hello, thank you for calling. Uh, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, very important for us as a country. We are thankful for this visit, for these signals. And of course, uh, we are going to uh, fight till the end. And it's very important that we have the sup support of the uh, free countries, democratic countries, including the USA. And it's very important for the agricultural sector of Ukraine because it provides uh, the uh, possibility to plan, to move forward, and to keep uh, uh, growing, seeding, harvesting, and moving on. So this visit has also provided the necessary uh, uh, feelings of stability for the farmers, Ukrainians, which is important because we are going to start seeding in a few weeks. OK, so that provides a backdrop of more stability, if that's possible, uh, Deputy Minister. Can I ask you about the grain export deal that is currently in place that allows Ukrainian products to be exported around the world? The deal signed, of course, with Russia. I know that the renewal of that it should happen in the middle of March. What progress has been made on that grain export deal? Uh, when we talk about grain export deal, uh, two deals have been signed. Um, one deal was signed uh, by Ukraine, Turkey and United Nations, and another one by Turkey, United Nations and Russia. So Ukraine keeps uh, negotiating and communicating with our partners, first of all, Turkey and United Nations, that it is uh, very extremely necessary to prolong the uh, grain deal, which really ends in the mid of March. First of all, it is very critical for the international food security. So far, our partners are uh, doing their best to prolong. All of the uh, Western countries understand the importance of prolongation, and we hope that it's going to happen, uh, and the sooner the better, because once again, it is a possibility to keep planning for the uh, ships to come in, for the production, trading, and so on. Mm. So you're hoping that the deal will be prolonged, the conversations are ongoing. Do you think that perhaps Russia will change the terms? I know that you've pointed out there are two deals here. Your deal is not with Russia. But do you think that Russia will try to change the terms? Uh... Of course, each time it's, uh, there are some negotiations, uh, Russia also uh, tries to, uh, to get maximum for its side, but also Ukraine has proposed to uh, make the amendments in terms of uh, uh, adding additional posts or adding additional varieties of agricultural products. So it is still the matter of uh, negotiation. Uh, at least it's very important to save at the current conditions because we have seen the uh, positive effect of exports from Ukraine to the international markets, and uh, we will do our best to keep it. Also, Ukraine keeps developing all the other necessary routes of export because we are uh, ready to fulfill uh, uh, all the obligations in supplying the agricultural products to the countries they need. 
Uh, Deputy Minister, you've said that the planting season is going to, or the sowing season is going to start in a few weeks' time. What are your expectations for the grain harvest in 2023 compared to last year or compared to, to years past? Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, when we are talking with our farmers um, and planning, uh, it's uh, so far positive news that farmers are going to so uh, see the, all the uh, areas available. So uh, we uh, hope uh, and plan that at least the same areas are going to be uh, planted and then harvested as in 2022. Unfortunately, still the overall harvest uh, uh, likely will be less than in 2021 because in 2021 we have the record harvest. Uh, first of all, because less fertilizers are used due to the uh, economic problems and lack of financing for the farmers. But still, uh, the areas which are going to be used and sold are going to be the same. Uh, and that's very mm. positive news. How are farmers faring financially? How are their finances looking? Is a lack of finance holding the farming, uh, the farming industry back in Ukraine? Uh, it's one of the biggest challenges, uh, availability of financing. That's why Ukrainian government uh, have started since uh, last year the program which compensates interest rates for the credits taken by the farmers in the banks. Uh, which have supported a lot. Also, there are plans to keep financing this program this year. So, uh, together with such measures of the government and support of international partners, uh, we are go doing our best to solve this financing challenge and still provide the necessary financing to farmers. But due to the very expensive logistics, first of all, because of Russian blockade, of course, still farmers receive less prices and it's hard for them to invest in very intensive technologies. Taras, thank you very much for joining us. Ukraine's first deputy minister for agrarian policy and food. Taras uh, Vysotsky, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you Coming for up on the programme, we'll switch our focus to China. The big four could be no more in China as authorities urge state-owned firms to phase out using the world's biggest international accounting firms. We'll have that latest story for you next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix in London this morning. And now to a Bloomberg scoop. Uh, Chinese authorities have urged state-owned firms to phase out using the four biggest international accounting firms over data risk concerns. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's China regulation reporter, Qiu Yen Wang, who's in Hong Kong for us. Qiu Yen, good morning to you. So what did China tell its state-owned enterprises about this change? What, what's the message from China? Morning. So from what we understand, Beijing has told some of the uh, state-owned companies to let audit contracts with the big four firms to expire. So they don't need to cut ties immediately, but to gradually offload them and to replace them with local Chinese or Hong Kong auditors. There is no hard deadline as far as we know. OK, and what's interesting about this is the story itself, but also the mood it creates. And it seems to fly in the face of recent developments where we saw uh, the US regulators and Chinese companies reaching some kind of, or the Chinese government rather, reaching some kind of deal around audits. How are these stories joined up? Well, the PZOB inspection itself was successful, but Beijing is still concerned of data security with all its companies' financials to be handled by Western uh, auditors. And on the other hand, China also wants to grow its own uh, professionals to let them have more experience to deal with bigger companies. Hence, we, we heard about the, the, the directive. Mm, yeah, so there's a sort of competition element to this as well. Why do these companies then need to cut ties with big four firms? I mentioned in, our, in, our, in the introduction that this is to do with data, concerns around data security. What's the argument there? Well, they are really not quite sure about um, how the uh, Western auditors is going to handle those. And that's why they, they want to look into that. 
But then for international investors, it could be worrying because it could be even more difficult for the Chinese SOEs to appeal to international capital if they shift from big four to use local auditors. So, but I mean, we will have to wait and see how the impact set in. Yeah, so we'll see how this plays out for the Chinese firms and for the auditing businesses, the international ones and the Chinese ones. What will it mean for international investors then, looking at China, trying to work out what this tells us about how open to outside expertise China is? Well, this is certainly not a good sign for them. With uh, you know China seeking to be included in more like global indices and then all the international opening um, schemes that that could send a not a very good signal to it. So, but but then again, this is kind of the um, very early beginning that we 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 are seeing the sign. So we we'll have to wait and see for the impact. Uh, Qian, thank you very much for joining us, Bloomberg's uh, Qian Wong, with the latest on that developing story in a Bloomberg scoop. Back to the earnings stories here in Europe. Lloyd's shares have slipped after the bank's guidance for net interest margin. Disappointed some analysts outweighing the announcement of a £2 billion uh, share buyback. Some uh, analysts describing that as a little light. Now, speaking to us earlier, the CEO of Lloyd's banking group, Charlie Nunn, said the UK lender has resilience and remains very competitive for savers. We're very focused on our savings customers and, and our borrowing customers. I think the important point of context for savers is uh, about 80% of our 26 million customers have less than £5,000 in their deposits accounts and savings accounts, and 65% have less than £1,000. So in terms of the cost of living and those that are struggling to ends, make ends meet, uh, we have a real focus on those customers. For those customers that do have money to invest, uh, we've been very focused on the savings market. As you'll have seen uh, at about Q3 last year, when base rates got to about 3%, we saw a much more dynamic savings market. Consumers were looking for returns. And Lloyds Banking Group um, has started to uh, put savings products on the shelf that can meet the needs of those customers. There are savings mm. products but ranging between 2% and 5.25% for those that are looking to, to build their savings over time. And you said this morning that you're seeing more competition in that space, Charlie. What kind of businesses are, are providing that competition at this time? Uh, the savings market in the UK is a very dynamic, competitive market, and uh, there's a, a set of smaller financial institutions that offer competitive rates, uh, investment firms, but also the major high street banks, and, and obviously Lloyds Banking Group is the biggest retail and commercial uh, bank in the UK. So we are in the latter group, but you've seen dynamic competition around all of those players in financial services. Can I ask you about the, the bad debt story over at Lloyd's? Any sign of, of distress in your books? Clearly, you've given us an update on provisioning today. But what are you seeing? Yes, the overall um, uh, uh, economic environment is resilient for our customers, both for individuals, families and businesses. And as we exited 2022, you, as you said, we did increase our provisions uh, around our economic scenarios largely for 2023 and 2024, but we continue to see very resilient customers. There are some very specific areas where we're seeing customers start to miss early payments, but it's still by product significantly below or below the levels we saw pre-COVID. So very resilient customer behavior. Lloyds Bank CEO Charlie Nunn speaking about the customer base and the experience of running that business, talking to me a little bit earlier here on Bloomberg TV. Coming up on this programme, we check out your stocks on the move today, including Rio Tinto. That's after the mining giant misses profit estimates and cuts its dividend. The stock uh, trades down in this morning's session by 2.9%. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London. Now let's get a Bloomberg Business Flash. Top corporate stories we're covering here at Bloomberg. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Anna. Microsoft said there will be no deal to buy Activision Blizzard unless it comes with blockbuster game Call of Duty. The UK's antitrust watchdog suggested Microsoft may need to sell the title for the takeover to go ahead. The software giant's president spoke after a closed door hearing with EU regulators. We don't see a viable path to sell off the part of this company, Activision Blizzard, that makes Call of Duty. 
given that, I think that the alternative is really quite clear. Either the deal gets blocked or it gets approved with guardrails, with regulatory controls. Now, Cities Group Jane Fraser has been awarded $24.5 million in pay for 2022, making her the only major U.S. bank CEO to receive a pay rise. In her first full year in the job, Fraser was granted $1.5 million in salary plus stock awards of just under $20 million in total, a 9% increase on the year. And McKinsey is said to be cutting 2,000 jobs in one of its biggest rounds of staff reductions ever. Bloomberg sources say the move will affect support staff in roles that don't have direct contact with clients. It's part of a plan dubbed Project Magnolia and aims to preserve the compensation pool for the firm's partners. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrins and this is Bloomberg. Anna. Leanne, thank you very much. Now from uh, the business stories we're following to the stocks on the move, let's go to Farah El Barawi who joins us from our equities team with a rundown of stocks that we, are, we have in focus. Farah, take it away. Good morning, Anna. First off, we have Rio Tinto in focus. Fell as much as 3.2% after the mining giant cut its dividend. Uh, dividends have been a major uh, investment thesis for these commodity stocks, and we've seen Rio Tinto slash its uh, payouts to $2.25 per share. That's nearly half of what it was a year ago. Uh, it did say that its earnings were impacted last year due to softer demand from lockdown hit China, but like its rival BHP, who yesterday said that they are more optimistic on China going to this year. Rio Tinto sees a slightly better outlook for 2023. And uh, this is kind of just another highlight of how China continues to be a major um, factor for European stocks. And then looking on to Lloyd's, it uh, did fall as much as 3% after it uh, announced the buyback of two, uh, uh, 2 billion pounds. But that wasn't enough for investors because it did slash its net in interest in uh, margin uh, forecast. And margins and buybacks have been the key uh, focus really for um, European stocks uh, and actually for the global earnings season. And we've seen Lloyd's miss on that. And they touted that to, due to uh, higher competition for the uh, mortgage market, as well as central bank rates peaking and the UK um, recession or likely recession um, weighing on its margins. And finally, we have Stellantis, uh, which followed Mercedes-Benz and BMW. And again, those shareholder payouts, Anna, they're the most important things really this season. And shareholders rewarded it strongly. Uh, this buyback program of as much as $1.6 billion was after strong results, um, fuel, uh, fueled by higher uh, prices for vehicles, uh, boosted its um, its profits. So, and then we look into the forecast for this year. They're actually still optimistic for double-digit profits, uh, profit growth, and they do expect actually vehicle price increases to start slowing uh, as ch uh, supply chain shortages start to ease. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks to Bloomberg's Farah El Bawagi with the latest on the stocks that we have our eyes on this hour. She was just talking about Stellantis. We'll be speaking live with the Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares. Don't miss that exclusive conversation coming up at 12.30 p.m. London time, 7.30 a.m. in New York. And another top interview coming up. Rio Tinto CEO joins us to discuss the mining giant's full year results at 10.30 a.m. UK time, 5.30 a.m. in New York. Uh, that's one stock that's certainly on the move. Surveillance Early Edition is next. Equity markets are really pricing that outcome now. We don't think they're pricing a recession. The biggest market in the world, we're looking at a flat return. We will agree that Fed <clears throat> is going to continue to raise rates. That's not the issue. The issue is how long will they stay up? How long will bond yields be up? The Fed is going to keep going. I agree. I think they'll go through to June, maybe even July. Can't be ruled out. So, no, I wouldn't be participating in stocks right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. 
The Fed is in focus after bonds were battered yesterday. FOMC minutes take center stage with traders looking for additional rate hikes and clues on those hikes. The big four suffer a big blow in China with authorities in Beijing urging state-owned companies to stop using the world's biggest international audit firms. And Stellantis, the maker of the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye, shows its muscle. The automaker sees surging cash flow and strong demand and, critically, announces a big buyback for investors. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson, stepping in, of course, for Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller, of course, over in New York. Matt, it's going to be a big day. Big day yesterday in terms of the sell-off we saw in bonds and equities. What's the setup overnight out of Asia? Yeah, it was a huge day yesterday. I mean, for one thing, we had the Dow Jones Industrial Average completely erasing its gains for the year. For another, uh, we continue to see a climb in yields that amazes. I mean, I can get 473 on a two-year right now. Um, that's pretty incredible compared to what we've seen for the last decade or so. Uh, check out futures right now. S&P futures just barely up after the worst drop we've seen all year yesterday for stocks. The S&P was down 2%, bringing its gains for the year down to just over 4%. The U.S. 10-year yield, uh, about five basis points shy of 4% right now, 394.68. And as I said, the two-year yielding 473. Um, so you're getting some pretty big climbs in yields. That obviously offers real competition in terms of stocks and raises a lot of other questions in credit. They're going to put Dan Albaltaji a little bit later on. Crude coming down a little bit, $1.26 to 79.08. Uh, Maybe that's going to lower prices at the pump. Um, when I finally get my Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye, I'm probably going to get about eight <laughs> or nine miles per gallon uh, in that beast with um, 797 horsepower. Uh, and then Bitcoin, you can see off about a third of 1%, but still over 24,000. So 24,118. This I find very interesting, if not as big an asset uh, or asset class as it once was. The lack of volatility is amazing because as the S&P falls 2%, typically you would expect Bitcoin to take a battering as well, and it holds pretty firm here. In terms of Asia, what we see is um, more of the same. Big drops in equities. The MSCI Asia Pacific uh, index down one and a third percent. The Nikkei, a big loser, one and a third percent as well at the close. And then the uh, dollar weakening a little bit against the yen, but still holding at a relatively high level, just around 135. Guy, what do you see in Europe? I, I definitely wrote that headline for you, Matt, by the way. Thank you. I, Matt told me before the show the coolest car that Stellantis make, makes is that Hellcat. So hence we had to put it in the headlines. European equities not looking quite so clever this morning. Uh, it is a follow through trade story. Uh, a little bit of Wall Street still to be priced in. Uh, and you can see that really across the piece. Uh, FTSE 100 down by around a percent. You've got the DAX down by six tenths. Uh, the Cacaron is down by seven tenths of one percent. Those are the main markets. Let's take a look at some individual assets and see what's happening there. Uh, I want to start with the stock 600 in terms of the level. 460, we're right at it now. We're down by another seven tenths of one percent. Keep an eye on the German two year, but also keep an eye on what is happening with peripheral spreads. Uh, you've got them up by another four basis points today. That is the Italian 10-year BTP. In terms of individual stocks, we're going to be speaking a little later on to the Rio Tinto CEO. Is this the new reality in terms of returns for investors? Uh, Rio Tinto certainly pricing maybe that in today uh, after that, uh, that move lower in terms of the dividend returns to shareholders. We're down by, let's call it circa 3%. Stellantis, let's get back to that Hellcat. That stock is up by 1.88% right now. Um, they're seeing an easing chip story. The cash flow story looks good as well. They're selling higher uh, priced cars. Uh, it looks like Stellantis is on the front foot uh, and it is certainly showing that kind of view to its investors right now. The surprise today, I think, Matt, is in that buyback coming yeah. from Stellantis. But like, the cash flow story is really good. Yes, and we're seeing buybacks really across the industry, right? Mercedes and BMW as well. I think Jonathan Farrow is going to talk to Carlos Tavares of Stellantis a little bit later on. Uh, I'm looking for. I would like to see Farrow in a super stock on the drag strip. That would be a great place. Yeah, uh, uh, for I think I think I think I think he is going to be focused more on the fact that Real Madrid beat Liverpool last night five two five two at home. I, Liverpool were at home. Seven that is not a goals good in a soccer game? I would watch that Amazing. kind of game. 
All right, let's get back to uh, China right now and the big four. Authorities have urged, which in Chinese means ordered, state-owned firms to phase out using the four biggest international accounting firms over data risk concerns. Kian Wong, Bloomberg China regulation reporter, joins us now uh, from Hong Kong for more. So, Kian, what, what did China tell the SOEs, really, you know, its own domain about the change? So from what we understand, Beijing has told some of the state-owned companies to let all the contracts with the big four firms to expire. So they don't need to cut ties immediately, but then to gradually offload them and to replace them with local Chinese or Hong Kong auditors. So as far as we know, there is no hard deadline. Is this going to be something that continues beyond the state-owned enterprises? Is this going to be something that ultimately gets applied to all Chinese firms? We have no uh, information on that yet, but then um, uh, so far we have seen quite some uh, dozens of um, private and state-owned firms who have changed to smaller audit firms already. Uh, it's from the public filings. All right, Kian, thanks so much for joining us. Kian Wong uh, reporting from Hong Kong on what could mean a loss of revenue um, around the size of $3 billion for the big four accounting firms. Let's get to consultancies right now because McKinsey is said to be cutting 2,000 jobs in one of its biggest rounds of staff reductions ever. Bloomberg sources say the move will affect support staff in roles that don't have direct contact with clients. For more on this, we're joined by Shanali Basic, global, uh, global finance correspondent for us here at Bloomberg Television. So what does this mean, Shanali, especially for MBAs? Because this is, you know, one of the obvious choices for someone graduating from business school to get a start before going on to make millions as an investment banker. <laughs> or you choose it instead of an investment banker and then move on to the C-suite in corporate America or whatever you want to do. But I think the important thing here is this idea that they're doing something very similar to what a Goldman is doing here. They're doing this to preserve the money for the senior partners, for the upper echelons of the firm. What does that mean for the rest of the staff? Is this mostly support staff or does it impact at a broad degree to your point, this incoming hiring, because McKinsey, Bain, these large consultancies tend to be some of the biggest hires of MBA programs. The tech pipeline is starting to cool off. The pipeline for investment banking jobs is starting to cool off. And again, as you said, these are typically very big pipelines for young people looking at uh, the big finance, tech, uh, and corporate America workforces. Shanali, ChatGBT has arrived on Wall Street and JP Morgan, according to one of our stories, is restricting the use uh, of, of that chatbot from its staff, by its staff. How quickly is this story moving? I, how, how embedded already is this type of technology into Wall Street and, can, and, can, and how are regulators going to treat this? Yeah, listen, this was kind of only a matter of time because when you're working at a large bank, who you work with as a third party a technology firm is a really big deal. But you have traders, and we've been hearing this for weeks now, all across Wall Street playing with chat GBT for all sorts of functions, hmm. whether that's help creating a pitch book or help figuring out an investment thesis or writing letters to shareholders and uh, research notes. So, yes, of course, J.P. Morgan is sitting there, uh, like many banks, saying, wait a minute, we have not chosen this this as our technology yet. But remember, Wall Street has been transforming uh, very quickly into automation. The very big question that's under the surface, Guy, is what does ChatGBT mean for the businesses that are not already heavily automated? You think bond trading, for example, where there hasn't been that huge shift towards automation yet? Can ChatGBT, because of its natural language processing, help something like that more than other things like creating a pitch book, which, frankly, there are already, already tools to automate that. I would I, get a little more creative than Chad GBT. You, you know, I, by the way, while we're on the subject of yeah. uh, Dodge Challenger Hellcats, right, I literally tried <laughs> to use Chat GPT over the weekend to find me a car. They're so difficult to source in this market, and the, the thing was useless. So it can't <laughs> do everything. Maybe it can write you a speech, but even that, I'm going to say, 
I've heard from traders saying that they were exactly as you said more successful in finding a vacation than they were figuring out how to automate yeah. trading of the bond market. All right, Shanali Basic, so our global <laughs> finance reporter. Thanks so much for coming in early this morning. Now let's get back to the car story. High vehicle prices and pent up demand proved profitable for Stellantis and surely for their dealers as well. The parent of Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot unveiled a share buyback of as much as $1.6 billion after forecasting another year of double digit returns. Joining us now from Paris is Bloomberg Autos reporter Albertina Sorsoli. So Albertina, what was the biggest surprise from these results? As you say, the, uh, the, the buyback definitely was a surprise. We've seen buybacks in the industry, as you cited earlier, Mercedes-Benz and BW, uh, BMW, but those are high-end cars, expensive cars. Of course, the whole sector has been charging a lot for cars in the past couple of years. Semiconductor shortages, supply, other supply constraints uh, held production back, so people were really willing to pay a lot uh, for the cars they managed to get their hands on. Uh, but again, Stellantis and Tavares had been good in guiding down the expectations for the fourth quarter and the second part of the year. There were massive delays in the deliveries just uh, because of a lack of um, uh, truck drivers, so a glut uh, of finished cars um, parked inside and outside, for example, the Sochaux uh, plant in eastern Fla France. So I think the expectations were lower and nobody had predicted a buyback. So definitely good news there for investors. Ooh. I'm going to ask this question because Matt doesn't want to talk about EVs, but Tesla, talking of charging, has been cutting prices. Albertina, is, is, is Stellantis going to follow suit? What are they saying about those price cuts and what they can do to compete? Uh, absolutely. It will be interesting to hear what uh, Carlos Tavares has to say on Bloomberg television in uh, a bit less than two hours. But we did speak with Chief Financial Officer Richard Palmer this morning. Uh, it was an intriguing comment. He sees, you know, the, the, the pace of um, car price increases that we've seen in the past couple of years are probably over. A supply, is, is supply chain is, are easing the problem, so uh, more production. Uh, but he sees uh, prices stuck. Stabilizing, so a bit of a bubble that is over and prices that will continue rising probably but to a lesser extent. Um, he also noted that the industry so far, ex-Tesla, apart from the Tesla move and Ford's move on one um, specific model, uh, remains disciplined. So from what we heard this morning from the, uh, the Stellantis CFO from Renault last week, we're not really expecting uh, massive price, price cuts immediately across the, um, the, 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 the panorama here. So no price war yet to date. All right, Albertina, thanks very much for joining us. Albertina Torsoli there in Paris, and we will be talking to the CEO of uh, Stellantis, Carlos Tavares, a little bit later on. We will also speak with the CEO of Mercedes, Ola Helenius, later on today, so you definitely want to stay tuned for those exciting interviews. Let's get a look at some of the stocks that are moving in the pre-market today. Coinbase is one of them after posting a more than $650 million loss in the quarter yesterday. You can see the shares down uh, about 1% in the pre-market at 61.50. Of course, Coinbase has already taken a massive beating um, since its high uh, last year. So definitely uh, keep uh, tuned in for what happens at the open. NVIDIA is another stock um, that you want to watch because it's coming out with earnings later on today. Right now only down six tenths of one percent. This uh, chip maker has been hot in the news lately because of the graphics uh, capabilities that it has. So it's useful for video games like Call of Duty, which is a, a hot topic in the news right now as Microsoft refuses to unload that in order to buy Activision. Also, um, Stan Druckenmiller, I believe, uh, his family office got in big to NVIDIA. And then Palo Alto had a revenue jump that pleased investors. And as a result, those shares are up almost 10 percent in the pre-market. So going against the grain uh, this morning, watch Palo Alto at the open. Guy? I'm going to be fascinated to hear what NVIDIA has to say about AI. I think that could be the new big thing for that company, Matt. It's going to be a fascinating uh, report after the bell, as you say, coming from that company. Talking of companies that we are going to be talking to, Rio Tinto reporting lower than expected profits after weaker demand from China. The company's CEO is coming up.
Uh, we are really looking forward to this conversation. What is going to be the message on China? Uh, and then uh, what about the markets? Anika, Anita Gupta, Wisdom Tree Director of Research, is going to be joining us. What did she make of yesterday's sell-off? Plus, crowdfunding their defence. How Ukrainians are digging into their own pockets to fund everything from drones to mortars. Read more on that story today in The Big Take. It's online. It's on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Anna Edwards has been doing a lot of other stuff apparently this morning, so not this show. Um, in terms of what's going on with buybacks, we talked about Stellantis, we heard about Mercedes and BMW, and a ton of companies obviously have been boosting their shares with buybacks. This shows just how much better uh, companies that have executed buybacks are doing than just the regular S&P. But I was talking to Guy Johnson this morning as he was riding his bicycle in a yellow warning vest. I wish I had a picture of that uh, this morning through Never the rain. Um, he said, I wonder what effect these buybacks have. We know they're good for equity holders, but on uh, credit and a company's credit profile, we should ask Dana Albaltaji that. And I said, yes, we should. Let's get Dana Albaltaji in studio. So here she is, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Credit, to talk about this, I think, incredibly interesting point. Dana, what do you think? I think it's a very interesting point because one of the big issues this year is the value of an underlying asset. Is the value of an underlying asset determined by the price or is it determined by the actual asset? And who determines that? And that is a huge issue with, you know, debt. So when you try to imagine how much money a company can get out of the debt markets, there are people out there that need to determine whether or not the underlying asset yep. justifies the amount of cash that they are asking for. There's also the, the kind of more cynical way of looking at this, and I'm sure this was on Matt's mind as well, is that CEOs basically are trying to basically make their yeah. potential pay packet look a little bit better. Yeah. They get paid based on the share price. Absolutely, and the market absolutely knows that. So this gap between valuations in the public versus the valuations in private are starting to widen, and we can definitely see that. You can see those companies that do the buybacks and the share prices yeah. are, are going up, but that does not necessarily mean that that share is more valuable. So should credit, credit investors be nervous about this? Absolutely, they should be nervous about this. And this makes the job of the analysts even more complicated really because they have to justify to their readers why this asset isn't worth as much as what the market is actually saying. We should spend more time talking about this. Dana's going to come back. We're going to talk more about this definitely. Uh, Dana El Baltaji joining us on what is happening in the credit story uh, and how buybacks are going to relate to that. Buybacks are a really big theme in this earnings story that we've been watching coming through. Um, anyway, for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. It is a fantastic, fantastic product. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. The Biden administration is under fire from both parties for its response or lack thereof to the Ohio train crash that released toxic chemicals. From Poland, President Biden called several officials for an update. Criticism is focused on Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Hong Kong is scaling back on fiscal stimulus this year. The government is trying to balance the need to lift the economy out of its pandemic slump while keeping the deficit under control. Hong Kong will still give out spending vouchers to eligible residents and offer a salary tax rebate, but both programs will be smaller than they were last year. Citigroup CEO Jane Frazier has uh, gotten a pay package of $24.5 million in 2022, making her the only major U.S. bank CEO to receive a bump in compensation for the year. Citigroup's profits plunged 32% in the same year. Frazier has sought to turn around the bank by getting rid of more than a dozen retail units around the world. 
And Microsoft has made it clear there will be no $69 billion deal to buy Activision Blizzard unless it comes with the greatest video game around, Call of Duty. Microsoft President Brad Smith spoke after a closed door hearing in Brussels with EU regulators. Earlier this month, British regulators suggested Microsoft may need to divest Call of Duty to get the deal approved, but they said, no way, Jose. By the way, guy, yep. if you're ever signed on, my gamer tag is shower fan. <laughs> Matt wanted to read that so that he could do that. Shower fan. So if anybody wants so, to so play against me, search for shower fan. Cod or pickle? Um, I would actually rather play pickleball. Pickleball is more fun. Okay. Rio Tinto, the company's out with numbers this morning. Stock is down. The CEO is coming up. Looking forward to this conversation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition, and this is what you need to know. The Fed, firmly in focus, Matt. Bonds batted yesterday, FOMC minutes therefore taking centre stage with traders looking for clues on additional rate hikes. The big four suffer a big blow in China with authorities in Beijing urging state-owned companies to stop using the world's biggest international audit firms. And Stellantis, the maker of the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye, showing its muscle. The automaker sees surging cash flow, strong demands, and announces a big buyback for investors. I'm Guy Johnson stepping in for Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller, of course, in New York. Matt, stocks batted yesterday, bonds batted yesterday. Today, let's see how we go. We're looking forward to those Fed minutes a little bit later on. Yeah, yesterday definitely looked like the end of the rally for risk assets as Investors sold off bonds as well, driving yields ever higher. We had futures up as we started this program about a half hour ago, and now they're turning down, albeit very slightly. You can see one one hundredth of one percent off on S&P futures. But the S&P in the cash trade is only up, I think, 4.1 percent year to date. So it's taken a lot out of that rally. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is now down year to date. Um, and we have yields approaching 4%. Look, the uh, 10-year yield has climbed another two basis points as we've been talking. 396.44. So uh, an amazing rally in yields. This is the highest level that we've seen all year after stocks posted their biggest drop of the year yesterday. Um, and bonds also have erased any gains that they would have made in yep. price uh, this year, pushing the yield higher. Crude uh, down 123 a barrel, 75.14. Of course, the concerns for risk assets is that the central bank is going to have to raise rates further. That puts more of a damper on growth. That's also a problem for demand in oil, although chi the China reopening impact, I think, really has yet to be seen. And then Bitcoin doesn't really move on this, down uh, half a percent, but still over $24,000 on a day when the S&P falls uh, 2 percent, when the Nasdaq falls closer to 3. It's pretty interesting to see Bitcoin holding so firm. Let's take a look at some of the movers in the pre-market this morning. We do have a drop in some of the um, big NASDAQ stocks. Uh, NVIDIA, which is also a huge weight on the S&P, um, down six-tenths of 1%. It's coming out with earnings later, and this will be key. A lot of investors, until yesterday afternoon, really, were telling me, we're going to shift our focus to earnings from the macro picture. It's no longer just about the Fed, but also what these companies are able to bring in. Let's see if that holds true with NVIDIA when they come out with uh, results today. Coinbase came out with results yesterday and showed that they're just losing a ton of money still. $655 million, I think, was what they lost. Um, it's their fourth quarter in a row of declining revenues. Coinbase just getting hit very hard all year long and uh, right now trading at 6120. Palo Alto is a different story for a tech company that's really swimming against uh, Wait, it's not swimming against the grain, what, against the current. Um, so Palo Alto boosting revenue, impressing Wall Street, and the stock up almost 10%. Guy, what do you see in Europe? Uh, I see a market that is continuing to soften, Matt. We were down at the get-go this morning. We've continued to drop. We're now trading below 460, 459.51 
on the stock 600. Uh, the sell-off in the bond market continues as well, particularly on the periphery. Um, we saw a big move yesterday. Today, that continues. Yesterday was about those super strong service PMI data uh, that I think can sort of caught a lot of people on the hop. Uh, and we're continuing to kind of rethink our approach, as Matt says, to, to how we should look at these markets and how we should look at the data. Was yesterday the day that the equity market finally stopped fighting the Fed? Um, let's talk about some individual names. Stellantis, uh, the maker of the, uh, the Challenger, the Hellcat, the car that Matt's so excited about. It is selling more expensive cars. It's seeing supply chains easing up. It surprised the market today uh, with a big buyback. The market is rewarding that stock as a result of that. Rio Tinto almost in the exact uh, opposite position. Uh, the stock's trading just north of 6,000 right now. Uh, it is down by 3%. We had a period of, of windfall profits. It was absolutely amazing. Has that period now come to an end? And what does that mean for the mining industry, Matt? I think that's a key question for this company and the entire sector. Well, then I'll pick it up with that. Let's bring in the CEO of Rio Tinto. Jacob Stalsholm joins us right now um, from the London Stock Exchange. Jacob, really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much for joining us on what must be an incredible busy day for you. Um, Guy Johnson, though, uh, points out you've had some windfall profits in recent times and investors may have got spoiled. Um, is this uh, new level of returns a new normal that, that investors need to get used to? Look, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we actually uh, reported a very good result uh, today. Uh, it's um, one of our best in history. And we declared the second highest ordinary dividend in the 150 years history of Rio Tinto. But it was lower than last year. And that was simply because we were having record high prices in 2021. But if you compare to almost any other year, 2022 was, uh, was an, an excellent result. And may I remind you, the return on our capital employed, and we are a very physical uh, uh, long-term business, is, was 25%. So it was a very, very good financial results that we had in the year. And we also, during the year, improved our operational performance. So uh, you are separating, though, some businesses, and I want to get down to that. The coal um, from the copper. Uh, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, the rival miner is separating some business of coal and a copper. This is Tech Resources, and you have um, long admired some of their copper mines. Do you think there's an opportunity for you to get in here and make some purchases? I mean, you talk about the investment, uh, the CapEx. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, long-term business. D does this make sense to you? So what we are doing is we are working and shaping our portfolio. And actually, last year was probably... Uh, the year where we shaped our portfolio the most for at least the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but it was mainly about developing things we already had in the copper uh, development, such as, uh, as uh, the oil Tolgoi mine in Mongolia. But we also acquired the, uh, the minority shareholders, took TRQ private. We did an acquisition of a project in Argentina of lithium uh, Rincon, but some of the internal developments meant uh, more iron ore in, in Western Australia, Roach Ridge, uh, Western Range. So we had a lot of, of, of ongoing business development. I don't really believe in that this company needs uh, major acquisitions, but we are actively looking at smaller things that could work for us. But my focus is always, are we the right owner? Does it make industrial sense for us? And uh, what guides us right now is the demands from our customers. And we can still strengthen our business in battery materials and copper, et cetera. But, uh, but I think that's what you can see we did last year, and we will try to continue to do so. But we are not growing for the sake of being, becoming bigger. It has to, we, has to, we have to be able to create value. Otherwise, we won't uh, pursue any M&A. Uh, you, you, good morning, Jacob. It's Guy. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. Let me add my thanks to Matt. Um, you, you talk about what is happening with battery materials. You, you've talked in the past about the fact that you would like to acquire lithium uh, and lithium mines. We do, though, have some of the big EV car makers. Tesla's the name that springs to mind, also actively trying to pursue those products. They are willing to pay, and they are willing to pay handsomely. And I'm wondering when you talk about value, whether or not you think you're going to be able to compete with those other potential owners of those assets. Well, we certainly don't want to uh, overpay. But what I suppose, my assumption is that what the car maker wants is lithium. 
and uh, you also have to have the competences of being a miner. So maybe maybe there's something that can be done uh, together, and that's what we are doing right now. We are selling lithium to some of the car makers, uh, whereas we are the miners of it because that's that's what we are good at. We we don't we are not going to go into car making nor battery making for that sake. <laughs> But, but we want to both extract and process lithium. Uh, I, yeah, be interesting to see you go into car making. Um, I, I guess <laughs> we, we could talk about that offline. Um, let, let's talk a bit about the cost base. Uh, one of the things that makes a good miner is managing the cost base, and that is incredibly challenging right now. Jacob, where do you see, what kind of inflation are you seeing right now, and do you see any signs of it peaking? Yes, yes, I do see, uh, see it peaking. If you look at our results uh, last year compared to the previous year, then uh, there was a significant increase in cost. And it was basically in three areas. One area is energy, second area is ge general inflation, and the third area is very high increases in input prices to our aluminium business. But I do think that we are seeing now, and we have seen lately, that energy prices have been falling. So we're not going to see that increase this year. Uh, and um, that doesn't mean that there's not inflation in the system, but you don't have inflation on such a wide range as you have now. So, so I'm, I'm cautiously con optimistic of lower inflation, but there are some inflation that stays. And unfortunately, we have very significant business in areas where there's a very tight labor market. And that means that there will be some... Uh, 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 pressure on, 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 on wages. For example, in Western Australia, where we have um, our big iron ore mines there, it is very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to get sufficient labor at this point in time. So there are some bottlenecks in the system, but it's, not, it's manageable, and I mm. don't see as much inflation as last year. To add to a couple of those things, you have a, a stake and investment uh, here in... Um, Guinea in iron ore, Sim and Do, uh, that project yeah. there, um, arguably, uh, according to our reporters, a great prospect. But if Chinese steel making declines, um, are you worried that there could be oversupply in that market? Yeah, look, that, that's, always a, that's always a risk, but we are, we are quite confident uh, steel is needed. Uh, steel, is, steel is needed in urbanization, in the developing world, you see growth. Of course, you also see more uh, uh, circularity in society, but there will still be a very strong demand for iron ore in the foreseeable future. And right now, we see a China opening up, and uh, a lot of the world's iron ore demand uh, is coming from China. So at least the short-term outlook looks, uh, looks attractive. Uh, it is indeed a very, very interesting project that we're doing in Guinea. It's, uh, it's going to be maybe the biggest mining project in, in the world. And uh, right now we are sitting and negotiating and all parties are very interested in progress. So I hope that we will uh, come to an agreement with the government of Guinea and, and can uh, start making it, uh, making it real. Jacob, you mentioned China. A couple of quick questions. Um, firstly, how are you thinking about the Chinese recovery? It looks like it's happening more quickly than many people had anticipated. How are you thinking about it? And when you think about what's happening in Europe and the United States, do you see a recession in those economies? Yeah. No, look, uh, I was in, in the US just 10 days ago, and it's probably fair to say that three or four months ago, people were very concerned about recessions in the West. Uh, but so far, the economy uh, of, of the U.S. economy has been stronger than anticipated, and I guess the recession risk is lower now. Secondly, the energy crisis in Europe seems to be much less than what was anticipated, and therefore the European economy is also stronger than expected. And then finally, uh, China is opening up, and uh, you have already seen the market reacting back in November. And there were actually some data points, because we could see, for example, that the stocks were very low of iron ore in China, and therefore some restocking would be necessary, of course, partly because of high consumption. So we have already seen it for a while. This is happening in China, and it seems to be happening uh, in, a, in a good, controlled, positive way. There's also been a lot of alarmism around the property market, but actually when we look at the whole property market in aggregate, it looks um, in a better shape than some of the indicators. So, so we are kind of quietly confident uh, that uh, the uh, uh, demand factors are attractive for our industry this year, 
mainly from China, but probably from the whole world. Jacob, really good to catch up. Thank you so much indeed uh, for your valuable time this morning. We really appreciate it. Uh, Jacob uh, Stausholm, the CEO of Rio Tinto. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Coming up, Anika Gupta, Wisdom Tree Director of Research. We'll be back to the markets. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You are looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Port of Los Angeles Executive Director Gene Soroka. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Guy Johnson stepping in for Anna Edwards this morning in London. Let's take a look at what's coming out of the Federal Reserve today. It's going to publish the minutes from its latest meeting at 2 p.m. New York time here for a preview is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. So, Valerie, what are we looking for? What do we expect? Look, the big one, I think, though, it's a bit out of consensus. Are there any clues on the Fed is, is, is debating on shifting back to a pace of 50 basis points? This we heard from uh, Bullard and Mester last week. They are non-voters, but the minutes might show that there was more discussion about it than we thought. Secondly, was there an emphasis on more work to do? Remember, going into this meeting, we had a string of soft data prints coming after a soft CPI print. But were they still convinced that, that, that maybe those March dots are going to have to rise and the terminal rate isn't high enough. And then lastly, did they consider scenarios of inflation falling quicker than forecast? Powell told us that this these minutes will give us a lot of detail. He talked quite a bit about the path forward for interest rates. Did they also consider the upside and downside risk to inflation? But the backdrop in markets is stretched in the moment in bonds. Two-year, five-year, 10-year yields all made intraday 2023 highs yesterday and today. Is this right for a retracement, or if 50 basis point pace is back on the cards, are bonds about to get clobbered again? They certainly got clobbered yesterday. Valerie, thank you very much indeed. Valerie Titel, ahead of the Fed Minutes, 2 p.m., I think is the time that they're going to come out, Eastern Time. Joining us now, uh, Anika Gupta, Wisdom Tree Director of Research. Anika, I want to get your take on yesterday's session. Was yesterday the session when equities stopped fighting the Fed? Yes, pretty much, Guy. You've hit it on, on spot. You know, we've seen uh, a repricing in break-even inflation rates. So we've seen over the, past, over the course of the last four weeks, uh, you know, the two-year break-even inflation rate was hovering around 2%, which meant that inflation was going to come down even below that for the break-even inflation rate to average around 2%. That's completely changed. It's now risen to about 1%, so it's hovering around the 3% level. And, uh, you know, we're now seeing a repricing of rates uh, in the U.S. where we're now, we've pretty much annihilated the probability of rate cuts uh, towards the end of 2023. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, three rate hikes over the course of the next few months uh, by the Fed. And I think that's pivotal because that's telling us that there's going to be a crack uh, appearing in risk mm. assets. We've had a strong run since September. Uh, and now that we're seeing higher rates, that's going to sour sentiment across uh, risk assets. Anika, we... Do you think, Anika... Sorry, Matt, well, you go. I was just going to point out, we all just finally understood what a no-landing scenario looks like. Are we not going to get <laughs> that now? Are we, are we coming down, Anika? So it's really hard to say, Matt, and the reason for that is clearly monetary policy, uh, to see the full effects of monetary policy, there is a, a lag. And typically that takes around 10 to 12 months. And we've seen such a sharp rise in rates in 2022. Uh, yet the uh, sell everything you own, uh, you know, philosophy that everyone had built up to towards the end of 2022 is now, you know, it, it's just completely evaporated. And we've seen uh, a lot more uh, interest in risk assets. Now, what's really interesting and, and hits to the point that you're raising is uh, we are beginning to see uh, the markets realizing that, yes, data has been a lot more resilient. But I think over the course of the next few months, we will start to see a slowing of the economy. So I think yep. this year is going to be very tricky. So you're going to have a tale of two halves where, you know, the first half of the year, uh, we are going to see central banks maintaining that more hawkish stance. But as that data deterioration takes place, 
uh, you know, by starting in Q2, that's when they might have to actually hold off on these sharp uh, rate hikes. OK, but let's talk about the first half of the year. Um, the rally that we've seen, it kind of started in September, really kicked off since the beginning of the year, Anika. The, the buy everything rally. Has that now run its course? Was it a bear market rally? And are we going to retest the lows that we've seen in equities, particularly in the United States? Yes, very much. And the reason for that is uh, we are going to see rates beginning to increase. And at the same time, we still haven't seen the full effect of the rate rises of 2022. Um, and the reason for that, the, I think the fundamental core of that rally was embedded in the fact that we saw that first inflation print in the U.S. showing signs of a peak. So it's very clear the headwinds on inflation from energy and food prices are coming off. But what still remains an unanswered question is the stickiness of the core inflation measures. And we'll see that uh, the full impact of that being felt as we progress into this year. Um, so, you know, it, it is a time to pause in terms of uh, this equity rally for having further legs to run because we are seeing higher rates, uh, you know, being priced in and that's going to sour sentiment for, for, for this equity rally. Anika, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. Anika Gupta. They are coming to us from Wisdom Tree. Coming up later, autos will be in focus. Not sure if we mentioned this yet, but Stellantis CEO Carlos <laughs> Tavares joins surveillance in the 7 a.m. hour. And then we're going to get a strategy update from the Mercedes CEO, Ola Kalenius. He joins us at 1 p.m. Eastern. I believe he's out on the West Coast with Ed Ludlow. Two interviews you don't want to miss if you care about cars, industry, global business, etc. This is Bloomberg.